So, um, I'm Pandora, this is Jen Davis, and she's our mason bee lady, and she's going to tell us what she's doing here with the mason bees. I'm um, sure. So, mason bees are also called blue orchard bees, and that's because they're absolutely fantastic pollinators. Uh, one mason bee can pollinate, um, uh, a 15 foot fruit tree can be pollinated by about two to seven uh, mason bees, and it takes almost 500 honeybees to pollinate the same tree. And that's because mason bees will fly in gray weather, lightly rainy weather, when it's a little colder. Uh, they tend to emerge earlier than honeybees. And they also are very intensive feeders because they don't like to go, go far from their homes. Honeybees can fly four miles round trip, sometimes even more for forage and they're constantly replenishing their colony by making uh, more and more um, babies. And so a honeybee colony can be like 70,000 bees. Uh, mason bees have a very discrete life cycle that goes from March until around early July, late June, and then they're dormant for the rest of the year. So they don't have the kind of energy or quick replenishment of their um, colony so that they can uh, forage for long uh, distances. So a mason bee likes to forage within about 300 feet, ideally, of where her home nests are. And uh, these are the home nests for mason bees right here. Um, I like to raise my mason bees in paper tubes. And you can see there's a brown outer tube and then there's a paper inner liner. And um, the reason why these are kind of ideal nests for mason bees in the wild, um, they would live in the pith of elderberry stems or maybe raspberry canes, bamboo. Uh, they are native, unlike honeybees. Mason bees are native to this continent. And there's uh, different species of mason bees that are scattered around uh, North America. The mason bees that I raise are uh, Osmia lignaria propinqua, and there's also um, some Osmia cornifrons, which are um, Asian horn-faced bees that tend to coexist with these mason bees, um, and they're, uh, they're, those are imported, but they, they don't cause big problems for the mason bees, so they tend to um, cohabit with, within these tubes. And this is a solitary bee, so unlike a honeybee, which has one queen that might um, lay a million eggs in her lifetime and then uh, raise, you know, thousands and, th and then thousands and thousands of young, um, uh, Mother Mason Bee uh, will uh, lay her own eggs and take care of her own nests, um, unlike the social honeybee. So she's a solitary bee. And basically the life cycle of the mason bee is in the um, early spring, uh, the mason bees emerge, and that's usually around mid to late March. They're starting to emerge right now. I brought a box of um, mason bee cocoons from last year that have uh, been emerged. I don't know if you can see that, but these um, there are holes in these cocoons where the mason bee has chewed out of this cocoon because um, fascinatingly enough, this bee can spin a cocoon around its body. So in the early spring, the male mason bees emerge. The mother mason bee, when she lays uh, her eggs in these tubes, she always lays the female at the back of the tubes and the males at the front. She'll, male, she'll put, there'll be about four to five males in the front and uh, three to five females in the back. The males will emerge first. They wake up before the females. They'll chew out of their cocoons. They'll come out of their tubes. Hold that. So here's some full nesting tubes. So the males will come out and then they'll start pollinating right away because they're gonna be drinking nectar from the nearby flowers and spreading pollen around while they're gathering energy for the females to come out. The females will chew from their cocoons and come out next, and the males, you'll see them coming back and forth, back and forth to the tubes, waiting for the females. Sometimes they get so excited, they go in there and they help the females chew out of their, their uh, cocoons. And um, then the males and the females mate, the males die, and the female gets very busy laying her eggs in these tubes. 
So she'll lay her fertilized eggs in the back. She takes a ball of mud, they're called mason bees because they use mud to fill their um, tubes to create different chambers for each egg. So she'll go to the back of this tube, she'll make a little mud pellet, then she'll lay an egg, then she'll go and make some bee bread, which is pollen and nectar mixed together, and it's a little pellet, a little tiny pellet, and she'll stick it in there with the egg, and then she'll seal that chamber with mud, and she'll continue that uh, eight to ten times, typically within a tube. And a uh, mother mason bee in her lifetime might fill two to four of these tubes. And then she'll die um, mid to late June, sometimes to early July. And um, then these eggs within these tubes will start to hatch. The larva, the little worm inside, will eat the bee bread that the mother has left for it. And then it will spin a cocoon around itself. And within the cocoon, the larva will pupate over winter into an adult. And um, then the life cycle starts all over again in about mid to late March, uh, depending. Um, our spring has come really early this year. I would say that flowers are blooming probably 20 days earlier typically than they did last year. And it's unfortunate because it's also cold and rainy. It's a challenge that we're seeing with bees. We're seeing forage blooming earlier and earlier but not necessarily the right climate for the bees to emerge. The bees really, because they're cold-blooded, they, they cannot fly around until it's 50 degrees, 55 degrees or more for about five days. They really won't even be able to warm up, get their metabolism going until then. So we're hoping that it's gonna get warm soon so that these wonderful blossoms we're seeing all over on our trees don't just fall off and there's no food for the bees when they emerge. That's one of the things that we're dealing with for global warming. So this box right here that I showed you with the empty cocoons is an alternative way of raising mates and bees. So you can put your tubes out in the spring and put paper tubes out and then just wait for the mason bees to chew their way out of the tubes and then continue on with their life cycle. A problem with this method, there's a couple problems with just putting whole complete tubes out. One of the problems is because the, that will leave a bunch of dirty tubes sitting around for the mason bees to come back and use. So mason bees, um, they are predated just like honeybees by some kinds of mites. Not the same kind of mite that, um, not the varroa mite that's predating our honeybee, but there's a hairy footed mite that predates our mason bees that can be very damaging. There's also pollen mites and they'll hitch a ride back with the mason bee back to the tube and then um, within the egg chamber those pollen mites will eat all of the pollen and the larva will starve to death. Um, there's also fungal diseases in particular chalk brood which also affects honeybees that is um, extremely contagious and any time that any of these creatures emerge from their egg cell from their from their mud cells in the spring they're gonna have to crawl past perhaps dead larvae in there that are affected with chalk brood or a nest of pollen mites. And when they emerge, they're going to be affected with all of these things. And so people often see failures when they raise mason bees just in these tubes without uh, any kind of hygiene or in those wood blocks with the holes drilled in them. Very bad for mason bees because ultimately those diseases and pests will accrete in those holes and the mason bees won't be able to survive for very long. So what I recommend, and it's more labor intensive, but is to remove your mason bees in about November. And a lot of entomologists are suggesting this. Um, there's some just argument about it. Is it, does it cause more problems than it, than it creates, you know, than it helps. But ultimately, it's been my experience that because these bees, just like our honeybees are threatened, and um, are disappearing at an alarming rate. Um, the more that we can do to help, th to help them with better hygiene and to aid them along in their emergence, in their emergence in the spring, um, the stronger the population that we're gonna get and the more bees we're gonna get. So um, that's why I remove my bees from the tubes in the winter and I segregate, I throw away tubes, I throw away bees that have been predated by um, uh, 
predatory wasps or um, pollen mites or um, have been uh, infected with chalk brood and other pests. Um, if I can't clean the, the, that off of the bees, then I just have to throw those bees away because they're sick. And then I put my cocoons in a box like this and I completely seal it up and I drill a hole in it in the front, the emergency hole, and then in the spring when these bees wake up, when it's warm, they'll chew through their cocoons, they'll see the light coming from this hole, and they'll come out this way. A, a benefit to this uh, technique also is that um, if you've got squirrels or rats or woodpeckers around, it's, it's more difficult for, pet, uh, for predators to get to your eggs than it is to come and chew from your, uh, in your tubes. So that's another advantage to that. So uh, this year I'm doing some experimentation. I'm going to leave some tubes out. And, I'm all, and I also brought um, some cocoons in the box. And I'm going to see sort of see how they're both doing. Um, because the reason I'm doing that is because it's very labor intensive to remove all of these eggs from here, all of these cocoons from here. And I just don't have the time this year. But also because, you know, there is an argument, which I think is um, something to think about, that if you constantly remove your uh, bees for generations and generations from their tubes, then you're aiding and abetting some of those weaker bees that couldn't make it um, with all of the challenges of the pests and the diseases and just literally the physical challenge of chewing through the tubes. You're going to... Um, you're going to cause a problem by creating baby, basically a weaker strain of mason bees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and you're going to be putting these up in the, the shelves? Yeah. There? Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's do that. Okay. Great. Right. So, um, so uh, here at Kalish Eco Village, we're going to put some mason bees up. I'm going to put my mason bee emergence box here. This is full of alive, sleeping mason bees that are in their cocoons. And you can see this little hole here. This is where they're going to emerge when they wake up. And then they'll start their life cycle. And then I've got some uh, nesting tubes for them. I'm going to put that on top um, so that when they emerge from their uh, tubes from, from their cocoons, they're going to know exactly where their homes are. Now ideally you're going to want to put your nesting tubes in a south facing position, south to southeast facing position, where it will be warm, catch that early warm sun, and also it needs to be dry. Um, otherwise you're going to get mold on your tubes. One thing that you're going to need to work, watch for with these is you're going to watch for um, uh, pests. Uh, we saw that there were some squirrels hanging around here. Squirrels can get in this. Uh, birds, especially woodpeckers, western tanagers, and also um, spiders can be a problem. So, got to keep an eye out for that. Then uh, we'll just leave these, and once you've got these situated, once the bees emerge and start uh, making nests, uh, making homes in the nests, you need to leave these alone and not touch them. And the only other thing that you need to do now until July is keep an eye on them, make sure that they're safe, and leave some mud for them. Uh, what I usually do is dig, a, dig down to the subsoil a few inches, not too far from their nest. So I'll ask the Kalish folks to do that. And then you need to routinely keep that mud moist so that the mom can come and uh, use some mud for herself. So what I usually do is just moisten the mud uh, every day with my hose for just a minute, and that's plenty. So that's pretty much it. That's all you need for your mason bees, and they're going to work so hard for you, and you'll have an incredible bounty. Um, they really do a fabulous job with pollinating your fruits and all your flowers. Well, thanks, Jan, for bringing those bees again this year. Oh, sure. It was fun. Mm -hmm.